4. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson joins us now. Colonel, it's always a pleasure. Welcome here, my friend. Before we get into your thoughts on the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview, there have been some events and observations in Ukraine which I would like to address with you, particularly because of your military as well as your diplomatic background. When we spoke last, which was a week ago, President Zelensky was saying, I'm going to fire a General Zelushny. I'm going to fire General Zelushy. It took him a week to do it. Yesterday he did and replaced him with a General Sersky, whose nickname is the Butcher of Bakhmut. Uh, what does this kind of a firing and transfer of authority when the government is on its last leg tell you? And B, what can you tell us about the Butcher of Bakhmut? 1. It either tells us that Zelensky is desperate, or 2. It's his political way of dealing with potentially the most difficult opponent he would have had to deal with if ever there were an election. And I got to say that I think Zelushny, Valery Zelushny, was very astute in what he did. And he didn't seem to be too unhappy about being fired, because now he's free of any further connection with the debacle that is Ukraine now. And if there is an aftermath, and one thinks there will be some sort of aftermath, he's going to help pick up the pieces, and he's going to have poll ratings politically to do so. So it's a good situation for him. Zelensky is desperate now. And just the fact that he hired this guy who, as you said, has somewhat of a tarnished reputation, although his defensive chief in the beginning was something that Ukrainians probably look at positively, I think the latter events have tarnished his reputation. So it doesn't point to Zelensky's having a lot of acumen in terms of picking his military leaders. How was General Zelushny, the one that he fired, recognized in the international community of high-ranking military officers? Was there respect for his skills as a military tactician and commander of hundreds of thousands of troops? Most of the assessments that I read that were written or spoken by people with, whom I have some respect for, and, boy, that community is growing smaller and smaller, said he was a reputable, competent general. And that's something for that entourage of players, for people to say that more than that, probably. I think what I saw, at least through the lens that I look, he handled the troops, and he handled the situation as well as almost anyone could be expected to given the circumstances. And I think that's one reason why Ukrainians have given him fairly high poll ratings. He's also a pretty good spokesperson, as I understand it. I don't speak Ukrainian or Russian, but I understand he handles crowds well, whether there are crowds of soldiers or crowds of civilians or a combination of their two. So could be a good politician as well as a fairly competent military professional since we spoke last. So this is like five days ago in the Sunday Washington Post. There is a report of 12 Ukrainian soldiers who told several Washington Post journalists who got very close to the front line that in their brigade, that is normally 400, there were only 40, and that a number of other. Brigades at the front line have suffered similar drastic reductions in manpower. Now, given that it's the Washington Post, is this something the CIA wants out there, or is this likely to be true? And if it is true, how catastrophic is that, Colonel, to go from 400 to 40 and then multiply it by the number of brigades that are out there? Absolutely catastrophic. And I'll tell you something else I'm hearing that I think is genuine. Doesn't come from the Washington Post, comes from better sources than that. And what I'm hearing is that the politics in Kiev and elsewhere are growing grim. And by that, I mean you've got people in Ukraine who now realize that the conscription process has taken the poor, the lonely, the detached, the non-oligarchical, the non-rich, etc., etc., more than it's taken anyone in the top rank. And so you've got what you'd have in this country if we suddenly got into a fracas and had to go to conscription. You got people really mad about being conscripted or having their youngsters conscripted and maybe dead or badly wounded or still on the front lines in the circumstances you just described and the rich boys getting out of it, and the rich girls getting a taking in 43, to 44, to 45 older people. And as one person said to me, Larry, 43-year-olds don't make good frontline infantry. Boy, do I know that you are desperate when you do those things. And then on top of that, you've got people now really concerned and getting angry about your conscription process, which is very unfair. Is this a conscription process like we have had in the U.S., or is this just impressment where they grab people in bars and on the streets and virtually or literally kidnap them? It's both. 
but it's not any kind of impressment of the rich kids. Got it? They're not in it. All right, so they're not going to the discos on a Saturday night. They're going to the bars down the side alley on a Sunday afternoon. Okay, I know this sounds ridiculous, so try not to laugh, but what is the significance of the UK Prime Minister offering to send British troops to fight in Ukraine and British jets to enforce a no-fly zone over Kyiv? Does he know what he's talking about? Absurd. I recently had a conversation with a Royal Marine who I know quite well, and I've had conversations with other British soldiers. And I will tell you right now what one of them told me. We don't have a land force adequate to defend Britain or even London. They are so small right now that to suggest putting British forces into Ukraine would mean British forces got swallowed up in about 48 hours. And their air force is not that formidable either. I mean, they've got some aircraft that are formidable and they got some good pilots, but no one's taken a look for a long time within NATO. No one of consequence has said anything about it anyway to the way the British have reduced their armed forces. They are tiny now. How did it get that small? 75,000? Money. They just don't have the money. They build one big ship and say, Whoa, whoa, look at this. We're floating her now. And the Royal Navy is a shadow of its old self. Don't the neocons recognize that this is a crushing disaster? And before you answer that, one of the princes of the neocons, Bill Crystal, with whom you may have had contact in your days in the State Department, actually suggested to the American government that Tucker Carlson should be barred from returning to the United States because he engaged in the freedom of speech with the Russian leader in Moscow. So neocons in general, recognizing their failure, do they ever? I had a number of times to meet with Bill Crystal, or see Bill Crystal, or talk with Bill Crystal. And I can tell you the latest one, as I recall, was when he joined the election task force, along with David from, and a lot of other people I was surprised to see in the room. I would just say, Bill Crystal's word, I would take maybe along with Lincoln, Penny, Bill Crystal, and Hillary Clinton, kind of from different camps, but they fit in the same boat as far as I'm concerned. For example, Hillary's comments about Tucker, I mean, those were as in politics, as a very bad remark, diplomatically speaking, about Godify. We came, we saw, he died probably the most incredible remark any American diplomat has made in the last 50, 60 years. I, 